great to be with you again. You know, uh, I was going to preach the first series of the series, and Dave was going to preach the next two, and then I was going to preach the last one, and we didn't anticipate COVID, but uh, I'm so happy to be able to fill in, and, and um, perfect timing, you know, our Lord's perfect timing, that I just happened to start, you know, working here at the church officially uh, right at the beginning of this, and uh, glad I'm here, and I, and I love the book of Haggai, and let me just recap briefly for you again. Um, what's going on in this this short little book at the end of the Old Testament? You know, ha- um, the last three little books, Haggai, Zechariah, and Malachi, were the last three books. It was God's last word to His people for 400 years. Not until not until the Gospels, not until Jesus Himself comes. Uh, some 400 years later, does God speak? And so, you know, in a sense, this was like God's His last word to His people. Uh, before this final word, which of course is his revelation of himself in Jesus Christ. So, so there's a very important message here. And again, on the surface, it's about rebuilding the temple. They've come back from their captivity in Babylon, where they've been sent, <clears throat> disciplined for their rebellion, their uh, waywardness, and they've come back. And uh, the, the place is a, is a wreck. <clears throat> the, the farms are abandoned, the houses are destroyed, and the temple is in ruins. And God said, I want you to rebuild the temple. <clears throat> it's important because this is where we do the sacrifices. This is where I reveal who I am. This is where I meet with my people. And again, they, they made a good start. Uh, probably the year 538, they worked for a couple years, and they got, then they got discouraged. They, a number of things I mentioned last week, they quit for 16 years. <clears throat> and um, God withheld his blessing, not because he hated them, not because he'd given up on them, but to get their attention, to arrest their disobedience. And uh, you remember, we, 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 you know, they, the people never said no. They just said not yet. You know, and, and so you know, we talked about that a couple weeks ago, how delayed obedience is really disobedience. You know, good intentions are, you know, they're with us every day, but um, God says, but you know, just planning to do it someday is not the same as obeying. And uh, so he calls them to repentance. Now, now follow the timeline here. In, in chapter 1, he calls them to repent of their disobedience. Um, and then in, in chapter 2, uh, this is like a month later, uh, he speaks to their discouragement, which we looked at last week. They've started rebuilding, but he says, guys, now look at it. How's it look to you? And, and the old men who could remember the first temple were really discouraged because this was not going to be the same. It just wasn't going to match up. And he speaks to their discouragement. He promises to be with them. He, I'm gonna, you're not on your own here. And all the things we talked about last week. Um, now, Zechariah is a contemporary And you need to kind of put this in here because in chapter 1 of Zechariah, which is just the next page in your Bible, um, it it says the people heard God's word and they repented. Okay? So so Haggai and Zechariah are are preaching to them about, come on, guys, we've got to build the temple. God, this is important. This is where God reveals himself. This is where we do the sacrifices. This is... You know, this is just not a, a little deal. This is, we're not going to have our relationship with God strong if we don't rebuild this temple. They repent, okay? And, and so they, they start the work. Even in their discouragement, they repent and they keep at it and they, 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 they stay with it. But now, this is a very strange thing. So in Haggai chapter 2, uh, verse 10, now let me just say this. They've repented of their disobedience. Now what God is calling them to do is to repent of their obedience. Do you know what it means to repent of your obedience? It's a much harder concept. You know, um, one theologian, John Gerstner, Put it like this. He said, the main thing between you and God is not so much your sins. It's your damnable good works. Now, we all go through this cycle in our repentance. 
it's very evident if you're if you're fighting an addiction. You know, it's like the uh, story of the, the smoker. He said, you know, it's not that hard to quit. I've quit hundreds of times. <laughs> well, that could be said of your age, uh, your your struggle with your thought life, your struggle with your finances and your selfishness, uh, your unwillingness to just be a loving, kind person in your neighborhood. I mean, we repent over and over again. In fact, in a, in a cycle of addiction, it's, it's part of the cycle. When a person is convicted or, or, or at least um, overwhelmed by the, the hurt they're causing in their family or how whatever the, the pain and the hurt of their addiction is causing, the mess it's made of their lives, there, there's a, a period of genuine sorrow and sadness and what looks like brokenness. Uh, I'll never do it again. This is where we, we make all kinds of promises to God, all kinds of amends to the people we've hurt. But it's all part of a cycle because the longer we behave, the longer we stay away from our addiction, the more we work at going to our meetings and you know, making amends and doing all, working all the steps of our program, what, what happens in our hearts? We start to feel entitled. You know, we start to feel like, well, yeah, I'm doing better now. I'm doing pretty good, actually. How come people aren't treating me better? How come, they don't, how come my wife doesn't trust me yet? You see what I'm saying? That sense of entitlement builds, and it just sets us up for the next failure. It just, it's, it, it just, it's part of a cycle. You know, I mean, a man can beat his wife on Friday, and Saturday morning he comes home broken with roses and, and, and all the apologies and all the tears, and she, she tearfully receives him back into the home, he tries hard to be good, and, but it doesn't take but a few days, and he loses it again. And this can go on month after month, year after year. My friends, we, we all can probably find some part of our lives that we can relate to that, okay? And now, this is why this is important. Now, now there are other sins that you seem to conquer. You know, you hear a, you hear a powerful word from God about a sin in your life and by God's grace you lay it down. I mean I know alcoholics and drug addicts who without rehab, without anything in fact one, one said to me one time you know I don't know if it's a good thing or a bad thing that I was able to quit drinking without rehab because I, it's made me so proud and self righteous. You see you're caught either way aren't you? Your obedience is either going to just set you up for the next entitled fall or you're going to really master that sin, whatever that thing is, and then you're going, to, you're going to be dealing with those damnable good works of yours that steal your heart from the love of God because now you feel like you're better than other people. Now you feel like God should be proud of me because I beat this. And so that's, that's, that's what I think that's what Haggai is dealing with here. Okay, now, now I want to tell you just a disclaimer. I told Debbie, you know, yesterday I'm a little nervous about this because it seems so clear and obvious to me that this is what God's saying, but it's just not in many of the commentaries. And and so I do say that, uh, but let me let me read, for instance, <coughs> this explanation. These shortcomings in in the Book of Haggai, their failure to to build the temple. These shortcomings are the reason for the dearth and the removal of the blessing. Therefore, uh, I'm sorry, these shortcomings are the reason for the dearth and the re their removal, the removal of the sins, removal of their disobedience, therefore, will bring Yahweh's blessing. Now, that, that sounds straightforward, and, 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 and there's some truth to that, but, but that's actually not from a Christian commentary. That's from the Jewish Encyclopedia of 1906. And, and one thing I've learned you know, over years and years of studying the scripture, most of the sermons that we preach could be preached by, a, from the Old Testament, could be preached by a Jew. 
as well as a Christian pastor, and, and it, the sermon would almost turn out the same. We must never, and Brother Jim would, I know, agree with this, we must never preach from God's word without it taking us to Christ. Spurgeon's, the old Baptist pastor, Spurgeon said, I take my text wherever it is in the scripture and I make a beeline for the cross. Every passage in scripture will either have some revelation of Jesus or it will have some revelation of our hearts that drives us to Jesus. But if we ever read a passage of scripture and somehow Jesus doesn't um, seem to be relevant to that passage, we've, we haven't properly understood it. And my friends, I think this is, this, is, this is exactly the point that God is making here to Haggai, through Haggai to his people. Repenting of your disobedience is not enough. It's not the point. You need Jesus. Now, this is exactly what he's saying here. And, and let, me, let me just break this down to you so you can see where it is in the text. I mean, this, this, this thing about going to the priest... You know, it seems kind of strange, like a parenthesis. That, how exactly does that fit? You know, the, the two examples, if you, if you have some sacred food that's been consecrated on the altar, you know, and, and it's in your robe, does that mean that everything else that touches that sacred part of your robe is now it's sacred? No, the priest says, no, you can't. holiness is not communicable. Um, now, what about the other he's the priest? What if, what if you touch a dead, a, a dead body? And the old, he's pulling all this out of the Old Testament law. I'm not going to take the time to take you all those places. But if you touch a dead body, are you defiled? Yes, you are. Now, his, his point is simple. Uh, if you put a sick kid with a well kid, is the well kid going to pass the health to the sick kid? Or is the sick kid going to pass his disease to the well kid? It's, it's, that's why we're all sitting here with masks, right? <laughs> Duh. I don't, I don't need to explain that anymore. But he, he said, God says, that's how sin is. That's how it, this indwelling sin in your heart is. This is why, this is why he says in verse, in verse 14, so, so it is with this people and this nation in my sight, declares the Lord, whatever they do and whatever they offer there is defiled. He says, you can't make up for your bad works with your good works. It's impossible. You can't put a piece of moldy bread with a bunch of good bread and think that that's going to fix the mold problem. He said, There's this, there is absolutely no way you can make yourself presentable to God and remove the curse of disobedience by your obedience because it works the reverse now my friends this is a hard lesson for us to get I, I knew a car dealer who would spend all a very devout religious man not, not in my church um, he could have been but I wouldn't use an example if he was <laughs> but uh, um, very devout religious man gave a lot of money to his church but he cheated single moms and little old widows every day of the week in the cars he sold them. Got as much money out of everybody who walked into that car dealership as he possibly could without reference to what, you know, a truly fair deal was. Or, and, and if somebody went in there and said, look, I trust you. I hear you're a godly Christian man, so just tell me what's the fair price. Well, then you were badly taken advantage of. But he felt fine about himself because he, he gave so much of that profit to the Lord on Sunday morning. Okay, now we all struggle with this, right? We have this internal sense that, yeah, you know, my life's not squeaky clean everywhere, but I, but I do serve the Lord. I, I talk to people all the time who feel like their affair wasn't that bad because they were witnessing. <laughs> I'm not kidding. Well, I was talking to her about Jesus. I mean, we met at the bar, and I, 
And she's very interested in the Lord, and I'm hoping she'll come to church. And yeah, we crossed the line. We went too far. But I mean, we all have this thing in our heart that somehow our obedience will overshadow our disobedience. This, this whole thing on, the, call the priest. Let's ask the priest. What does the law say? The point of that is it doesn't work that way. Your obedience does not take away your defilement. In fact, whatever they do and whatever they offer there is defiled. It's already defiled. Okay, now, now think about this. Why, why is it impossible for your obedience to be enough? Well, first of all, because it's never complete. It's never total obedience. Galatians 3.10 says, what does the law say? If, you, if you're going to live by the law, cursed is everyone who does not continually do everything written in this law. You'd have to have perfect obedience all the time. Well, of course we can't do that. There's, there's no way. Uh, the other reason our obedience can never be enough is because what I said earlier. I mean, it's just our determination to obey. It just sets us up for entitlement and, and the next failure. Or if in an instance where, you know, you know, if somebody told me not to smoke, I could do that. In fact, I have done that. You know, am I proud of it? Well, not really. It just wasn't hard for me to think of not, uh, you know, putting that stuff in my lungs. Can I, can I be around a smoker and not feel a little proud? Well, yeah, I can, actually, because <laughs> it's not a big deal. But there are other sins where, you know, uh, this, is, this is, can be the problem with virgin rings for teenage kids. I mean, they're either going to fail and feel miserable, or they're going to succeed and feel proud as heck that they're better than their peers. It's a tricky, it's a tricky thing. But you see why your obedience can never be enough. It can never be enough. Because it's going to, in best case scenario, it's going to lead you to self-righteous pride. Okay. The other reason it's, it's not enough is because the object of, of your obedience is what? Why are they trying now to obey? Because they want God's blessing. They want the crops to grow again. And what does God say? He, he, he says in verse 17, I struck all the work of your hands with blight, mildew, and hail, but you did not turn to me. He's saying you turned to obedience, but you did not turn to me. The object of your obedience was wrong. Not only is your obedience insufficient, but the object of your obedience is, is not right at all. You're just trying to not get another spanking. God says it was never about that. It's about our relationship. You're my bride. I'm your husband. And you're chasing other lovers. You've fallen in love with the blessings and not the giver. Of the blessings. My friends, God's never been after our obedience. He's after our hearts. Now, when, 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 when he reaches our hearts, of course our obedience matters. But now it's an act of, it's, it's a loving, Lord, how can I serve you? God, I don't want to hurt your people anymore. I don't want to hurt you anymore. God, I want to love. I don't want to hurt because of you. Does that make sense? Now, um, what's the solution? If, if everything you touch is already defiled because you touched it, <laughs> because it comes out of your heart, your selfish heart that feels like my obedience is enough or if it's already defiled, what's, what's, your, what's our hope? My friends, there is no hope if Jesus isn't our perfect, righteous, obedient sacrifice. This passage drives us to Jesus. There's no escape. There's nowhere else to go. That's 
why Luther says grace is like a ring of fi- the caterpillar in the middle of a ring of fire. There's no way out except above. It's, it's um, a beautiful call to look at our Savior Jesus. You know, you know Warren Buffett, actually, the rich, second richest man in the world, next to Bill Gates, a while back he gave a billion dollars to Bill Gates' uh, foundation, Bill and Melinda Gates' foundation for you know, eradicating disease in the world and helping education and things like that, really good causes. Uh, he gave a billion dollars to their foundation. He put a billion dollars into his own foundation, and he put a billion dollars into each of his three kids' foundations. Five billion dollars. Um, and you know what he said? He said, there are many ways to get to heaven, but this is a good one. Isn't that, I mean, I don't know the man. He's probably a pretty good man. But I I can tell you this, that's not a way to get to heaven. It doesn't matter how many billions of dollars you have. The gift is already defiled because you gave it. You already touched it. But my friends, there there is a way. There is a way. There is one who is perfectly righteous, whose obedience is a sacrifice before the Father that's acceptable. His death on the cross for our sins, his perfect obedient life presented to the Father on our behalf. It's in him that we are accepted as righteous. And God says, you don't have to earn all these blessings I'm withholding. I, I, I freely give them to you. I love you. The only reason I'm withholding them is to get your, rest your attention and draw you back. You know, um, there's a story of a, of a wealthy man who had, was an art collector. And this, this was his passion. And he had a son that he loved, just, just him and the boy, him and his boy. And... Um, when he passed, there was his son had died uh, in in the war, and and it was just broke his heart. But before his son had passed, he had a, a beautiful painting of his son done, a portrait, and um, hanging on his wall, you know, with all his other masterpieces. I mean, he had just masterpieces worth millions. But then he had this beautiful picture of his son that was, frankly, not worth anything to anybody except to him. Well, when he died, he had no heirs. The son was already gone, and he, he had, they had an auction for his, uh, for his stuff. And the auctioneer said, okay, by, by the orders of um, the master of the house here, the first painting to be auctioned is this painting of his son. So who will give me $100 for this? I mean, they're, they're waiting to spend thousands on these other paintings. Who will give me $100? Let's start at $100. Well, no hands went up. Come on. It's like... Went $90, you know, $80, $50. And everybody's getting, come on, when are we going to get to the real stuff? You know, and, and uh, finally somebody said, oh, okay, I'll give you $50. You know, let's just get this thing going. And uh, so he gets the painting, and then the auctioneer says, the auction's over now. The uh, instructions were very clear. Whoever takes the sun gets all the rest. Because there was only one painting in that house that was really precious to the father. The rest was just all stuff. My friends, that's how it works. When you receive the son, you, you get it all. If you try to get it all without the son, you miss the whole point, And you miss it all. Okay? Let's not forget Jesus this Christmas. Amen.